Chapter fourteen of True Tales of Arctic Heroism in the New World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Ernest. True Tales of Arctic Heroism in the New World by Adolphus W. Greeley. Life on an East Greenland Ice Pack. And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold and ice mast high came floating by as green as emerald coleridge the second german north polar expedition sailed under captain carl coldaway in eighteen sixty nine with the intention of landing on the coast of east greenland near sabine island whence by winter sledging the explorations of the northern coasts of greenland and of the north polar basin were to be undertaken the two ships of the expedition the germania and the hansa reached by the middle of july the edge of the great ice pack which in enormous and generally impenetrable ice masses streams southward from the arctic ocean between greenland and spitzbergen as an accompaniment to this vast ice field come from the glacier fjords of east greenland most of the enormous icebergs which are sighted and encountered by transatlantic steamships off the banks of newfoundland the ships separating through misunderstanding of a signal, the Germania, a steamship, succeeded in working her way through the ice stream to Sabine Island, where her crew carried out its program. The Hansa, without steam power, and so dependent on sails, became entangled in the pack in early August, and was never able to escape therefrom. The fate of the Hansa and the experiences of her crew form the subject matter of this sketch until the hansa was fast frozen in the pack on september nine captain hegeman was prepared for any emergency whether the ship was crushed or if opening lanes of water should permit escape to sabine island from which they were only forty miles distant completely equipped and victualled boats were kept on deck so that they could be lowered to the ice at any moment when the ship was frozen in the captain faced resourcefully the serious question of wintering in the pack it was known to him that no ship had ever escaped from such wintering in the drifting ice pack of the greenland sea and indeed the violent and frequently recurring pressures of the ice field pointed to the early loss of their ship life might be possible but health and comfort could not be had in boats covered with canvas cramped quarters severe cold damp bedding and absence of facilities for cooking forbade such an attempt while others suggested the snow houses of the eskimo one fertile mine urged that a living house be built of coal which was done fortunately the coal supply was in the form of briquettes coal tiles nine inches broad quite like ordinary bricks in shape thus went up the most remarkable construction in the annals of polar history a house of coal on a foundation of ice the hansa was moored to one of the so-called paleocrystic floebergs several square miles in extent nearly fifty feet thick with fresh-water ponds and an uplifted central mass thirty-nine feet high near which hill the coal house was built to ensure its safety with water from the pools to pour on the finely powdered snow the arctic masons had a cement that quickly bound together the tiles as they were laid in courses the ship's spars were laid crossways for the main rafters and other wood was used for the completion of the roof frame over which were stretched reed mattings and sailcloth coal tiles made a level and convenient floor whence in case of necessity they might draw for fuel in the late winter with a double door and provision caches in the house they awaited the action of the pack still comfortable in the ship's cabins with joy the hunters learned that the ice field was not wholly desolate but that it was the hunting field of the polar bear who was followed by the arctic fox who deftly snapped up under bruin's very nose any outlying bit of seal that was within reach in the early days before the pack had become an unbroken ice mass a hunter espied on an adjacent floe a large she-bear with her cub a boat was quickly put off to cross the narrow water lane when to the surprise of every one the old bear followed by the cub rushed forward to meet them at the edge of the floe gnashing her teeth and licking her chops clearly unfamiliar with man and his weapons and anxious for a meal as they fired the bear fell dead on the snow but the cub instead of running remained by her side licking and caressing her mother in the most affectionate manner 
she paid no attention at first to the advancing hunters save to alertly elude the many efforts to cast a noose over her head finally the cub became alarmed and with piteous howlings ran away escaping over the rugged pack despite a shot which wounded her in the middle of october came a series of violent blizzards which foretold the coming fate of the ship the groaning grinding ice-field was breaking up under enormous pressures that came from the colliding floebergs which were revolving under various forces of wind and sea currents though trembling violently with her masts swaying to and fro the hansa was spared great fissures in the floe near by showing how close was her escape all of the crew were busy preparing for the worst fuel food and clothing being carried in quantities to the house the end came on october nineteenth within four miles of the east greenland coast when a gale sprang up and the collision of the fast ice of the shore and the moving sea pack had already increased the ice pressures with fearful results mighty blocks of granite like ice shoving under the bow of the ship raised it seventeen feet above its former position in the ice while the after part of the hansa was frozen in so tightly or jammed so badly that it could not rise under which conditions it was certain that the stern would be racked and strained beyond service the dangerous situation was dramatic in the extreme with the dying wind the sky cleared the stars shone with keen brilliancy the cold increased sharply to forty-five degrees below the freezing point while as if in mockery of man's sorrows the merry dancers flashed upward in dagger-shaped gleams wavering an instant and then vanishing only to come again in new forms with ever-changing colors to a mere observer it would have been a perfect picture of adverse arctic conditions wonderful in its aspects and surprisingly beautiful to an artistic eye with relaxing pressures the great ice ridges slowly decreasing in height fell apart and the ship was again on her usual level but rent fatally and making water fast in vain did the whole crew strain at the pumps while the outpouring water from the spouts froze on the deck as it fell the water gained steadily and orders to save the cargo were given worn-out men worked frantically dragging out bedding food clothing medicines guns ammunition sledges boat furniture and everything that could be of service for life on the floe best of all for their comfort and amusement they hoisted over the rail of the ship's galley heating stoves games and books they felled the masts for fuel and stripped the sails for house use fortunately the energetic seamen were able to strip the ship of all useful articles before she sank on october twenty second eighteen sixty nine in seventy degrees fifty two minutes north latitude a few miles from the greenland coast they now faced a situation of extraordinary if not of imminent peril it was barely possible that they might reach the coast six miles distant but that was to face starvation as everything must be abandoned for a cross flow march if the shore was reached it was well known to be ice-clad and desolate as there were to be found neither natives nor land game along the narrow strips of rocky ice-free beach which stretches from sea glacier to sea glacier on this seemingly accursed coast the only chances of life were in the shifting and uncertain forces of nature a cold winter to keep the ice-field intact a stormless season to save their flow from breaking up under pressures and the usual greenland current to set them to the south with good fortune they might hope to get into open water seven months hence when by their boats they could possibly reach the danish settlements of west greenland but could they live seven months through a winter barely begun at least they would do their best they were fourteen men all good and true in health skilled to the sea inured to hardships and privations accustomed to discipline and inspired by a spirit of comradeship their flow had been wasted at its edges by the enormous pressure as well as by the action of the sea so that they were thankful for hegeman's foresight in placing the coal house remote from the ocean all that sailor ingenuity could plan was now done to make life healthy and comfortable in their arc of safety outer snow walls were erected so that there was a free walk around the main house giving also a place for the protection of stores against storms and shelter for daily exercise from their flagstaff was displayed on fine days a flag emblem of their love for their country of their faith in themselves and of aspiration and uplifting courage in hours of danger the hunt engaged their activities whenever signs of game were noted 
once a bear and her cub came from the land and the mother was slain and added to their larder an effort was made to keep the cub as a kind of pet after a while she escaped and was caught swimming across a narrow lane of water to keep her secure they fastened her to an ice anchor where she was at first very much frightened but later she ate with avidity such meat as was thrown to her to add to her comfort a snow-house was built with the floor strewed with shavings for her bed but the record runs the young bear as a genuine inhabitant of the arctic seas despised the hut and bed preferring to camp in the snow some days later she disappeared and with the heavy chain doubtless sank to the bottom of the sea nor were these castaways unmindful of the charms of arctic nature their narratives tell us of the common beauties around them the snow crystals glittering in the few hours of sunlight like millions of tiny diamonds night scenes were even more impressive through wondrous views of the starry constellations and the recurring and evanescent gleams of the mystical aurora under the weird auroral light the white snow took at times a peculiar greenish tint and with it says an officer one could read the finest writing without trouble one night it shone so intensely that the starlight waned and objects on our field cast shadows but in its main aspects life on the ice pack was full of dread in which nervous anxiety largely entered the barren peaks and rounded snow-capped land masses of the greenland coast were usually in sight and once they were astonished as they walked to see thousands of tiny leaves possibly of the arctic willow flying about them signs of a snow-free fjord not far distant again the newly fallen snow for a considerable distance was covered with a reddish matter which dr laub thought must be of volcanic origin carried through the air from iceland two hundred miles away of interest to the party were the visits of foxes who came from the nearby land of the first it is said with tails high in air they shot over the ice field like small craft sailing before the wind for the first moment it seemed as if the wind had caught up a couple of large semicircles of whitish yellow paper and was wafting them along one was shot as a specimen but the later visitor in the middle of december was better treated we are told that the fox white with a black tipped tail was particularly confiding even bold he scratched up the bare flesh buried in the snow and carried it off to eat as we approached he then quite unconcernedly took a walk on the roof of our house and through the small window convinced himself as to what we were doing should we shoot it no it was a long time since we had seen such a fearless creature at times we placed nets with a meat bait to tease him but he always managed to get clear of them meanwhile their coal house with the flow was drifting south slowly with the coast of greenland in plain sight distant from five to fifteen miles their safety always the subject of daily talk seemed assured until the coming spring for they were on an immense floeberg whose area of about four square miles was dotted with hills and vales while sweet water lakes gave abundant water for drinking and cooking a great boon it was known that surrounding floes were daily grinding huge pieces of ice from the edge of their own and that the ice pressures were steadily turning it around so that one week they saw the rising sun from their single window and the week following noted the setting sun therefrom at first this flow rotation was completed in twelve days but later with reduced size stronger currents and high winds the floeberg made a full rotation in four days at times there were welcome additions to their slim larder of fresh meat one day a seaman rushed in breathless to say that he was sure there was a walrus nearby all were instantly astir and soon a walrus was located a black spot on the clear white of an adjoining floe with great celerity and caution the whaleboat was launched in the intervening lane of open water and with notable skill the steersman hildebrandt maneuvered the boat within rifle range without disturbing the rest of the sleeping animal the first shot wounded the walrus so badly that he could move away but slowly on the approach of the hunters he struggled with great fury breaking through the young ice and attempting to strike down the hunters as they approached to give him his death wound covered with hide an inch thick the walrus was so colossal that it took the united strength of ten men using a powerful pulley to raise the carcass from the water to the main ice under the outer hide was a layer of fat three inches thick 
which was almost as acceptable for fuel as was the meat for food to men who had for so long a time been confined to salt and canned meats as their principal diet the odor of the burning walrus fat seemed to attract bears from long distances one inquisitive bruin sniffing at the meat in one of the boats fell through the tightly stretched canvas covering and scrambling out growled at the night light by the outer door of the house and passed on safely a second animal was wounded but escaped the third whose acute hunger brought him one dark night to the house in search of the odorous walrus fat was received with a volley and was found dead the next morning the quiet christmas holidays celebrated with german earnestness had brought to their hearts an unusual sense of confidence peace and hope based on their providential preservation excellent health and physical comfort this confidence was soon rudely dispelled giving way to deep anxiety at the devastation wrought by a frightful blizzard that burst on them with the opening new year then the crew realized that there was a possible danger of perishing in the pack since at any time their immense floeberg might break into countless pieces in the very midst of the polar cold and the winter darkness with the violent wind arose an awful groaning of the ice pack due to the tremendous pressures of the surging ocean beneath and of the crowding floes around so violent were the movements of the floe itself and so great the noise of crashing bergs that they feared to longer remain in the coal house and in terror of their lives they sought refuge in the open although the snow-filled air made it impossible for any one to see a dozen yards yet at least there was a chance to escape if the floe split under their feet which was felt to be possible at any moment they made ready for the worst though escape from death seemed quite hopeless rolling up their fur sleeping bags and clothing they filled their knapsacks with food forming a human chain they ran safety lines from the house to the several boats well knowing that in the blinding blizzard one could not otherwise find his way to the boat to which each one had been told off for the final emergency they then set a watch of two men to note events and entrusting their souls to god the rest of the party crawled into their sleeping bags for such needed rest and for such possible sleep as might come to the most stolid when the gale broke two days later they found that they had escaped death as by miracle three-fourths of this seemingly stable flow had disappeared broken into huge shapeless masses barely a square mile of the flow remained intact with the coal house perilously near the edge instead of in the centre scarcely had order and comfort been restored when ten days later an even more furious blizzard burst upon them actually bringing them face to face with death in the middle of the night the watch cried out loudly all hands turn out with their furs and knapsacks now kept ready for instant action they rushed out and stood in place each by his allotted boat the hurricane wind made movement most difficult snow filled the air their flow was quivering from awful pressures while the howling gale and groaning ice pack made a deafening tumult nothing could be done but to stand and wait suddenly the captain cried out water is making on the next flow an adjoining floeberg of great size and thickness had split into countless pieces and where a moment before had been a solid ice surface was a high sea tossing broken ice masses huge pieces of their own berg now broke off due to the action of the sea and to collision with the crowding pack while looking with a feeling of despair at the high waves now gnawing and rapidly wasting the edges of their flow they were greatly alarmed to hear a loud sharp report as of a cannon shot before any one could stir even had he known where to go their flow burst with a fearful sound midway between the coal house and the wood pile within a dozen yards of the house now appeared a huge chasm quickly filled with huge waves which tossed to and fro great ice blocks which beat against the flow remnant on which the dismayed men stood though all seemed lost the crew without exception acted with courage and celerity by prompt work they dragged up on the sound ice the whaleboat which barely escaped dropping into the sea aware that they could not launch and handle in such a storm the largest of their boats hegeman told off the men to the two small boats in the pandemonium death was thought to be close at hand with this thought they gave a last handshake to each other and said a final farewell as they separated and went to their allotted stations by the boats 
the physical conditions were so utterly wretched that some even said that death would be welcome the roaring of the pack was unceasing the hurricane-like winds continued while the temperature was forty-two degrees below freezing the sharp cutting snow pellets of the blizzard not only blinded the vision but the clothes were saturated with the sand-like ice particles driven through the fur to their very skin where they were melted by the heat of the body food was not to be thought of save a bit of biscuit which was eaten as they stood for ten hours they stood fast by their boats in shivering misery and in mental anxiety knowing that any moment they might be thrown into the sea but by god's protection in a providential manner after being reduced to a diameter of one hundred and fifty feet their flow held together the dangers of the sea and of the ordinary pack had still another and a novel phase when matters seemed to be at their worst the watch cried out we are drifting on a high iceberg they stood immovable as the lofty berg loomed far above their heads close on them and after hanging a ghastly object over their tiny flow for a moment vanished in the mist while their hearts were yet in their mouths they had barely gathered together and arranged their few remaining effects when another frightful storm came upon them while there were ice movements around them all went to sleep except the watch when with a thundering sound their quivering flow broke in two a broad fissure passing through the floor of the house captain hegeman says god only knows how it happened that in our flight into the open none came to harm in the most fearful weather we all stood roofless on the ice waiting for the daylight which was still ten hours off as it became quieter some crept into the captain's boat sleep was not to be thought of it was a confused unquiet half slumber from utter weariness and our limbs quivered convulsively from cold it was forty-one degrees below freezing as we lay packed like herrings in our furs with a heroic devotion to duty the energetic cook had the courage to make coffee in the shattered house on the very edge of the gaping ice chasm that ran down into the sea hegeman says never had the delicious drink awakened more creatures to life this cook was a notable character never discomposed but invariably self-possessed even in the most critical moments while the shattered coal house seemed in danger of falling into the sea he was busy repairing a kettle when the captain suggested that he leave the house owing to the peril he said if only the flow would hold together until i finish the kettle then i can make tea so that you all may have something warm before you enter the boats no pains or trouble was too great for him when the comfort of his shipmates was in question the poor doctor of the expedition did not have the iron nerves of the cook and under the influence of constantly recurring dangers he developed melancholia which lasted to the inn of the crew in general captain hegeman says throughout all of the discomforts want hardships and dangers of all kinds the frame of mind among the men was good undaunted and exulting all denied themselves to give comfort and to show consideration to the afflicted doctor at a gloomy period there came to them amusement and distraction through the visit of a frisky fox from the mainland who remained with them many days with growing boldness he came up quickly without signs of fear when bits of meat were thrown to him from the cook's galley his gay antics and cunning ways were the source of much fun finally he became so tame that he even let the men he knew best stroke his snow-white fur on may seventh eighteen seventy they were near cape farewell the southerly point of greenland where they expected to quit the ice field it was now two hundred days since their besetment and they had drifted more than six hundred miles with all in health save the doctor snow had now given place to rain the pack was rapidly dissolving and at the first opening of the ice toward land they left their old floe and faced in their three boats the perils of an ice-filled sea afflicted by snow-blindness worn out by strenuous unceasing labor storm beset at times encompassed by closely packed broken ice through which the boats could not be rowed or pushed and over which man could not travel they at last reached iluidlek island the voyage at starting was supposed to involve four days of navigation but it took twenty-four days to make it now food became scarce for the first time neither seals nor bears being killed so that they were always hungry hegeman writes talk turns on nothing but eating conrad was quite sad this morning in his sleep he had consumed ham and poached eggs 
one after another, but on waking felt so dreadfully hollow within. Threatened by a closing pack, they hauled up with great difficulty their boats on a large floe. They found a low shelving edge of the ice and emptied the large boat of its contents. Rocking the boat backward and forward, head on, when it had gained a free motion, the whole crew hauled together on the painter when the boatswain cried loudly, Pull all! When the bow caught the edge of the ice, the boat could in time be worked gradually up on the floe, but it was a heart-breaking, exhausting, prolonged labor. Storm-bound for four days, they resorted to various devices to pass the time and divert their minds from hunger. The loquacious carpenter spun old-time sea yarns, Vegasac tales of astounding character. In one story he related his experience as captain of a gunboat when, having no sailing directions for the North Sea, he steered by the help of a chart of the Mediterranean from Bremen to Hull. When he arrived off Hull, he verified his position exactly by a sounding, which proved conclusively that he was at Ramsgate, south of the Thames. Thus did folly beguile misery. Cut off from land by closely packed ice, they finally made the journey practically on foot, carrying their food and baggage on their backs. The boats were dragged one at a time through soft snow and across icy chasms. This task left them in a state of utter exhaustion even the captain fainting from continued overwork. From Eluidlek their voyage was easy to the Moravian missionary colony at Friedrichshab, West Greenland, where comfort and safety were again theirs. Thus ended this wondrous voyage, which quiet heroism, complete comradeship, and full devotion to duty make one of the most striking in the annals of Arctic service. End of chapter 14 Recording by Mark Ernest